Good afternoon, everyone. We are continuing on our study in the book of Numbers. Now, in order for us to continue in chapter 14, uh, we need to actually look up a little bit in chapter 13. Towards the end of chapter 13, there were 10 of the 12 spies who actually went in to check out the place. And uh, they gave a bad report. In fact, they had half-truths and they slanted their report such that it scared the people. They said that we are not able to go up against the people. They are stronger. Uh, and they gave a bad report of the land. It says the land that we have gone out as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature, big ones. We saw the giants. Now, th these, remember, we're not talking about giants as in uh, the, the traditional English word. Uh, we, we mentioned that this, these are the Nephilim. And they are aggressors against the people of the land because they are bigger and they are the descendants of Anak, uh, where they, they, they are distinct, right? They are distinctly tall and big and aggressive and, ty and tyrants. From the, again, here it says, from the giants, uh, the giants here, again, it refers to the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and we were in their sight. Now, that is where we left off last week. Now, coming back to chapter 14, after listening to all these words, all the congregation, the group that was there. Now, some people think that this group would be the 70 people, uh, the 70 elders called the Sanhedrin. Uh, the 70 elders. No, we are not sure. It is a small group of people, by the way. It is not the, the 2 million people sitting there. And in context, it's likely to be that 70 elders that were selected for Moses. And so they lifted up their voices and cried. This is the beginning of a very tumultuous response bonds. Chapter 14, if we are careful in studying, is a turning point in the history or the relatively short history of the nation of Israel after they left Egypt by the hand of God, and now they are about to enter into the promised land, and yet they were not ready. And far from being ready, they were angry, they were frustrated, and they cried from hearing what that land might be, uh, that there were big people there, they will bully you, they will kill you. It's not a good place. Basically, the people were astounded and they, they wept and they cried. I guess you, you would say that this would be wailed, right? Wailed as though they were mourning bitterly. Now, why would they do that? It is this. They had anticipated something quite different in their minds. And they thought that there were walls in, and then there will be a land filled with milk and honey, and everywhere they turn, it would be like the Garden of Eden. And when the report came back, quite different from what they had in mind, they were completely destroyed emotionally. Now, that is the kind of scenario I think we should bear in mind as we venture into chapter 14. Their entire expectation were derailed because they had thought of something which was not exactly how it was turning out. And they thought that they had wasted all their time leaving Egypt to a place where they will not survive. 
strangely, as they have seen all the 10 miracles of the plagues in Egypt and crossing the Red Sea, had their water, had their quail, had their manna, saw God on Mount Sinai and received the law and now moving towards the promised land, things just changed that quickly. They weren't looking at God, they were looking at themselves. And so the children of Israel complained against Moses. Now this word complain is to murmur. To murmur is um, to, well, caused to grumble. Now, maybe grumbling is not a very strong word in our English language, but it is, how should you say, it is a display of stubbornness, a display of stubbornness, uh, and they, they, they are, well, I guess it is a, a, an expression of sheer disappointment against Moses and Aaron. Now remember, Moses and Aaron are the two mouthpieces of God. So God speaks to Moses. Moses uh, conveys it to Aaron and Aaron would speak to Pharaoh. And so the whole congregation was looking at them. And this is the context of the complaint. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or only we had died in this wilderness. Why did they say that? Died in land of Egypt, died in this wilderness. The, the idea here is that they weren't ready by themselves to face uh, an enemy as big and great and strong that is not quite like them. And so they are looking at these tyrants who are powerful and says, why has God brought us to this land to die by the sword? Now this word fall, uh, fall by the sword literally means be killed. Uh, you can observe the imagery that when the sword strikes and somebody is killed, he will fall down. And that's the word fall. It literally means fall. Uh, and, and by context with the word sword, it means that he was killed by the sword, that our wives, our women and children should become victims of this escapade. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Now, you must think of it this way. God brought them out of Egypt by his strong arm and now in chapter 14 of the book of Numbers, they're saying, it'd be better for us to go home, back to Egypt. But that was the first instant they called out to God to save them. And now they have forgotten what they did and they are asking to go back. And so they said to one another, let us choose. Now this word is um, select a leader. It means to... The word select a leader is to, uh, to give or grant a head. Meaning, it is time to pick a new head. Not Moses, obviously. And by him to return to Egypt. Now, this is the word shuv as used in this place. It is to go back to where they left. This, this is a very strange phenomenon. And then we, we, when we are now looking at it, we are mindful that God is with them, that God has protected them, provided for them, gave them the laws and instruction, showed them who he is by his strong arm and by his presence, Gave them the tabernacle, the laws, and everything else. And now, when they are about to enter into the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're now saying, we don't want Moses, we want to go back to Egypt. 
It's like a little child throwing tantrum. Uh, for any one little problem, it becomes a major crisis. Verse 5. Verse 5 now tells us this, that Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. This word literally means to fall, right? It literally means to fall. And what does this mean now is to fall upon the face, right? Fall upon their faces. Meaning they, they, they literally were down on the ground, right? They were down on the ground. And that's the picture we get. Fall on their faces, right? Upon the ground in front of all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Now, the whole assembly would also include the 70 elders, the leaders, and some of those who are behind them. But they represented the rest of the children of Israel. And this particular action, falling down on their faces, is also a sign of frustration and abhorrence by Moses and Aaron because they were commissioned to lead them out of Egypt to the promised land and suddenly they decided that they would pick a new guy and they want to go back to Egypt. And this is a demonstration of, of, uh, of a dismay, a disappointment or a form of an anger. Now, in verse 6, it says that Joshua, the son of Nun, or Yehoshua, right? Yehoshua, the son of Nun, and uh, Kalev, the son of Yefune, who were among those who spied out the land, Tore their clothes. Now, these are the two spies. Two spies from Ephraim and Judah. They tore their garments. And the word tear, this would be tear into pieces. It must be very strong uh, because it's not easy to rip it apart. So this whole idea is to rip apart. It is a very Hebrew expression when you are angry, when you are disappointed. They rip their clothes into pieces. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land that we pass through, right, to spy, is an exceedingly good land. It's a very, very good land. And it gives you a lot of things. And so if, now this is a very important word. The word if is conditional. It is conditional. If God, if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Need to be careful with this verse itself. If the Lord delights, this is hafetz. Um, if you look at Psalms chapter 1, verse 2, uh, but he delights in the law of the Lord and he meditates upon it day and night. That's the same word, delight. It is lean towards, it's having pleasure, taking pleasure in something uh, that you, you really want to express goodness. Now, if God looks at Israel this way in us, then God himself will bring us. This one, bring us, is to, is to cause to come in, to cause 
them to come into the land and give it to us and grant. Now, we have read this kind of words before when it talks about the land, that when Moses was on the eastern shore and they took on the northern part of the land of uh, Og, uh, the, the Amorites, when God says, I will give you the land, but God says, I will not give you the land of Edom, of Moab, and of Ammon. God has given them to the descendants of Abraham. But when it came to further north, God says, I'll give it to you. Now, the concept of God giving is that he is not wrapping it up in a bowl and, uh, and, and sending it on a trolley. The, the idea or the Hebrew idea of give it to us or grant it to us is allow them to win over their enemies, subdue them, and replace them in the land. That's what it means by to give. Otherwise, they are not to touch the land, like in Edom, Moab, and Ammon. It says, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread, their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So let's break this down. The first word is do not rebel. Do not go against, right? Do not uh, revolt. Do not revolt. Do not go against God. This is the first thing that he has said. Right, nor fear. Number two is to fear the people. The word fear here is from the word yara, as as one fears God. You don't have to fear the people of the land. They are our bread. Our bread, like right? lechem, like bet lechem. They are our food. What does that mean? That's a Hebrew expression that we are there to eat them up. We're there to take over them. We are there to be victorious. Their protection, their protection is called the shadow. The tzel, uh, it is their shade. So if you have a tree and then you have the shade, and if you are standing in the shade, if you're standing in the shade, it means that you have protection from the sun. That's what it means here. Protection, shade. You, have, you are being shaded. And so he says, this shade is gone. And once the shade is gone, you can't actually take them over. And who better is to fight with us? God, Jehovah, is with us uh, or together with us. So do not fear them. Do not be afraid of them. See, because right now they are so afraid because of the report that the 10 spies made. But what is the re reaction? All the children of Israel said, Stone them with stones. You gather them and throw it at them. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. This is important. This is the revolt. This is the revolt. And this is their reaction to Joshua and Caleb. And then God intervened. So we see the intervention of God. It appeared in the tabernacle of meeting. Now, every time God is said to be present, whenever the tabernacle of meeting is around, uh, and this would be in verse... 10, the Ohel Moed, 
right? Ohel, Moed. And Moses would go in. And this is, I would say this is God's intervention. And it says, before all the children of Israel, so they can see. When God came in his presence, where he says the glory of the Lord, this would be the cloud that came down, the pillar of cloud that came down upon the Ohel Maod. Right? The dark, thick clouds. And that represents the glory of God. So do not think of the glory of God only as light. It is about the importance, the heaviness of God, that God is showing his presence. And when that happens, that is an indication that God has is present in the, uh, the, uh, on the mercy seat. Observe what God said to Moses, right? Observe what God says to Moses. This is very important. He says, how long will these people reject me? The word reject uh, literally means to, to spurn, right? To push away. Uh, to provoke. Uh, what else can you say with this? Uh, some would say to blaspheme, but I guess you can say despise is a good word. Despise means I, I don't accept what God has said. Uh, I want to do what I want to do. Like these people say, let me, let's choose a leader and let's all go back to Egypt. That's spurning God's overtures of love and grace. God has promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bring them into the land by his mighty hand, and yet they say, no, we want to go back to Egypt. So how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? Now, all these are very key words. So let's break them up a little bit. How long actually means until when. That's the literal word. Until when will they not believe? The word not believe means not stand firm. That's what it means. Uh, not supportive. Meaning, whatever God says, they, they are not listening and they are not going to carry it out. That is what it means, not believe me. Now, it is important for us to be very clear that this has nothing to believe to about the, the existence of God. When you say believe in God, it has nothing to do with believing in the existence of God. These people see have seen God. They call upon God. God did 10 miracles and they're all called signs which I have performed among them. And they have seen, they've crossed the Red Sea, they've gone through all these. And yet at this point in time, time and time again, they said, why are we dying in the wilderness? Why are we here? This reaction by the Israelites is called not believe, not supportive. When her and Aaron were holding up the hands of Moses when they were fighting the Amalekites, that is, that is the meaning, the base root meaning of trust, of belief. It's to hold up, to support up. So to support what God says means to be sure and have confidence in it so that you can do it. And these people turn around and say, we want to go back to Egypt. That means each time they complain, God is defining those moments as not believe me. 
with all the signs. Now, God did not do any of these things in secret. These are clear signs, the signs. These are indicators. Now, in a car, when we want to turn left and right, we have an indicator. So we want to turn right, we'll turn on the right-hand side indicator and it will blink. Now, why do we cause it to blink? It is so that they can see, right? They, it is done, it is done among them so they can see. So when God did the signs, it wasn't done in secret. When God did all these miracles, everyone knew it. When they crossed the Red Sea, even the Canaanites knew it. And so these are the indicators. So signs in Hebrew is not a secret thing. It is a public display of the power of God. So whenever we, we want to, to establish that God has done certain things, there is no need to defend it because it will be well known and clearly seen. And now God displays his anger. I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a, great na a nation greater and mightier than they. Who is you? Moses. Verse 12 is a very important word. Uh, verse 12 talks about the same experience in Exodus chapter 32. Uh, verse 10. Before he came, uh, before Moses came down from Mount Sinai, they thought that he was gone. It took so long. And they, they got Aaron to make the golden calf. And God saw that and told Moses, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to start all over again with you, Moses. This is time number two. This is one and this is number two. And God says, I will strike them. Now notice the word strike has the intent of slaying in this case. I want to slay them with the pestilence and disinherit. The idea of disinherit literally means to, um, to cause to dispossess. Meaning, when you came out of Egypt, you are my people. But now, I really don't want you as my people. That's the idea of disinheriting. So that you have no share of the land that you're going to go in or you won't go in. And then I, God, will make of you, Moses, a nation greater and stronger than the Israelites. That is what it says. Once again, Moses being Moses, he's the most humble of all men, says to the Lord, he pleads for Israel one more time. You've seen that before in Exodus chapter 20. Now in Numbers 14, one more time, God is so angry with the Israelites that he wanted to reset, right? Uh, restart or reboot the machine again. Uh, regenerate his plan. What did Moses say? Moses negotiated with God like Abraham negotiated with God. Then the Egyptians will hear of it. By your might, you brought these people from among them. The Egyptians know God was with them. Now they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land uh, in the eastern shore of, of, uh, of the promised land that they have heard that you are coming among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face and your cloud stands above them and you go before them in the pillar of cloud by day, in the pillar of cloud by night. How would they know? Because the presence of God can be seen. Not just only by Moses, but by all the people, including all the inhabitants of the land. When he came over, they could see the cloud. 
And if you kill these people as one man, now this is important for us to unpack. When you kill these people as one, and one means one. One man means one, uh, well, I guess you could say one, one person. Now, why is it expressed this way? Throughout the Bible, every now and then you can hear the prophets referring to Israel as my servant in the singular, right? In the singular. This is also in the singular form. And Israel collectively as a corporate body is viewed as one person to God. This is a concept we have to be aware of. So whenever the, the prophets speak about one man, he is not speaking of anybody else, but usually by context, you can see God is addressing Israel and using a one uh, one person, a third person uh, ex, uh, uh, vocabulary to discuss about Israel. And if you kill these people like one man, now what does that mean? It means that if you kill one person, that one person falls down, the whole nation falls down as if it was one person. Then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak saying, because the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. Since God killed them all because something happened and um, God is unable to finish his promise. He says, and now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great. Just as you have spoken, say, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy. Forgiving iniquity and transgression, but but he by no means clears the ones who are guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of these people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Now just think of it this way. Moses is telling God that God, if you were to destroy Israel now and kill them as if you killed one person and the whole nation will drop down, then everyone who have seen and heard of you, God, is going to say that you are unable to bring your own people into the land. And so, secondly, he appeals to the character of God. What is the character of God in verse 18? He is long-suffering. It means that he is very patient. The picture here is long nose. In the Hebrew, whenever the, the Bible speaks about, Lord, you have a long nose, um, the, 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 the writer is not speaking that God is like Pinocchio. The long nose concept in Hebrew is not about lying uh, as Pinocchio in the story. When a person is said to have long nose, like God said, uh, telling God you have a long nose, it means that he is very patient. He is not yet ready to blow up on them, right? The next one is that he has a lot of mercy and this is kindness. This is chesed. And it says that you forgive iniquity. This is avon. You, you forgive perverseness when, when they take your words in your, your Torah and they twist it around you can forgive. And this word forgive means to lift or lift up. 
So all these abstract words in the English language has a corresponding uh, concrete word in the Hebrew. So lift up, that you will lift up their avon so that they are forgiven. And transgression, the transgression here is pesha. Both of these, uh, the, uh, Moses saying, you, will, you can forgive them. Uh, but he by no means clears the guilty. What does it mean to clear the guilty? The idea here is to make innocent. Right? Make innocent. That means to clear. To clear uh, And, and it says here, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Um, this idea, make innocent, is a very strong word. So let me just put it in a different color just to show you in the translation. Um, it literally gives us a picture of he will be by no means make innocent or uh, make clean. Make clean, totally. Right, This is that word. Make clean, totally. And it says that he will visit. The word visit is a literal word and it actually carries a meaning of paying a visit, paying a visit, whether to for for good or punishment, and so this is visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. We've read this in the new, uh, in in the Ten Commandments. Uh, it's regarding uh, idolatry. It's regarding the fact that God will be patient and when he strikes, it will be beyond the norm until the third and fourth generation. And what this means in simple terms in Hebrew is that when a generation turns away from God and misreads the Torah and goes and bows down to idols, then the following generations will continue to perpetuate and it's very hard for them to break that cycle. And so eventually God will come back and punish those people because they have continued the practice of idolatry. And so that is what it means, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Now Moses says something very strange. Pardon the iniquities of these people, I pray. Now, what do you mean by pardon? Pardon means to forgive. One of those rare occasions where you see this word. Forgive the avon. Forgive the avon of the people, I pray, I ask. According to the greatness of your chesed, kindness. Just as you have forgiven, right? Another word, lift up. This people from Egypt until now. The forgiveness to this people is so that this people will continue to listen to God and do what he says. And even till now, God has forgiven them time and time again. What is the purpose of this whole dialogue? Moses is saying, God, don't do it. Don't destroy them. Don't make me the head of the new nation. Your love for them is such that you, you will extend to them patience and kindness. Remember? Long nose and has said, kindness. You can forgive their 
Avon and Pesha. Now notice this is not forgiving their sins because in Leviticus chapter 1, sins refer to things that you miss when you deal with God in the tabernacle or the temple. But in this case, they come out and they complain against God, complain against Moses, murmur and provide bad testimonies. That would be an iniquity and uh, a, a pasha, a transgression. You're making God a liar. God says it's a land filled with milk and honey. And we say, no, it is filled with tyrants, big guys like the Anakims. And hence, they made God a liar. When you make God a liar, and the Hebrew people are very careful that they don't want to make any mistake in this regard because they fear God. And they had to say this, that Moses says, you have forgiven their avon of this people according to the greatness of your mercy. So the mercy or kindness of God can forgive certain kinds of sins, in this case, avon, iniquity, as well as the, the pasha, right here, one and two. Two different things. In verse 20 comes a very powerful phrase. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned. I have pardoned means I have forgiven. Right? I have forgiven. As you can see, Pasha and Avon can be forgiven when they repent and not do what they had set out to do. And so I have a, I've pardoned according to your word, according to the arguments that Moses made. But God says this right at the end. As I live, truly as I live, this is the, the oath to say it seven times, right? The oath. All the earth, not land, uh, not earth, but all the land shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did not, that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, have put me to the test now, these ten times. This is very important, these ten times, and have not heeded my voice. Notice, heeding my voice in verse 22 means they are not hearing. They are not hearing. And in so doing, God is very angry and disappointed with them. I, I want us to consider that Avon and Pasha is considered not hearing God's voice. When you, when you hear God's voice and you do something else, when you do God's voice and ignore it completely and, and try to fight God, when you, when you look at the, the, the uh, Avon and the Pasha, and, and God says, I have pardon according to what you say. What did they do? They did not, right? They did not hear my voice. And when you do not hear God's voice, God says this, they shall certainly not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall they any of these be re, of those who rejected me see it. So I, I think we have to be very careful to say, not heed my voice is a very important thing. And they are calling God a liar. And they are said to have rejected them, right? Rejected. 
Rejected means uh, contempt. Uh, also means to to spurn, which we saw that up there. Uh, provoke me. Right? Provoke me. All of these really is telling God, God, don't be our God. You, you have misled us. You brought us to a land that you're going to kill us with. And for some reason, they, com- they couldn't connect what they read in the Torah with the, the real vision and imagery where God displayed himself to the Israelites. And yet they can say, no, I don't want to believe God and I want to do my own things. But my servant, Kalev, because he has a different spirit in him. What spirit? Kalev does not have the spirit of subordination, insubordination or the spirit of uh, rejection or the spirit of denying God and has followed me fully. And so I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Now, the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. This would be the valley of the, in the Judean hills. And tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the sea of the reeds. This is what happens. This is the, the, the Red Sea. This, I think it's, uh, let's see. Then this would be Israel. And this would be Median. It would be God re- reveal, revelation. Based on this, Caleb had a different spirit. In that different spirit, Caleb have seen God crossing the Red Sea all the way that he has given the mana, given water, given quail, and went into the land to bring out huge buns or bunch of grapes and pomegranates and declare that the land that God is giving them is a land filled with milk and honey. And in so doing, they will not reject God, but encourage the people to do so. And it is important for us to realize that this different spirit means he has a uh, an, another another win, another character in him, not like those who reject God, right? He has followed me fully. Follow me means come after, after God, right? God moved and he walks after God. And I will bring into the land, I will cause to come into the land where he went as a spy, and to his descendants, remember, he is from Ephraim. And his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. What this really means is here. They are almost about going into Egypt, uh, into the promised land, but they are now to turn back into the wilderness. Instead of going into Israel, they are going away. So that's what it means by tomorrow uh, in verse 25, turn. This word turn is to turn around. It's a very vivid word that shows us that they're not moving forward, they're moving backwards. 
they are going away from the promised land into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Right, this part here. And so we now know that they are going to spend a lot of time in this part of the land. Northern Arabia, uh, where the Midianites are, the southern part of the uh, place of Adom. That whole area is a very interesting place. And, and it might just be, it might just be that they have spent uh, a good deal of time in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. And God says, tomorrow, go around and turn and leave. And he says, move out. The word move out is pull out. Like you pull out the pegs of the tent and you and, and just, just go. This is the, the, the feeling that you have with God and Israel right now. His anger may have subsided, but he meets out his judgment upon the people. And this judgment is not rescinded because later on, uh, there are 10 times, we will talk about it next week, 10 times that they have put me to the test. They have challenged God. Ten times. So observe the long nose of God. It's not one, two, three, but it's ten times. And we're going to look at the ten times before we continue because this is the part where we need to see the change in the tone towards Israel and how Israel missed the boat. And with this, we come to the end of verse 25 in chapter 14.